Psalm 149. And when you find your place, if you would stand. Psalm chapter 149. I've been reading a lot in the book of Psalms lately. Um, Somebody told me years ago, you ought to read Proverbs every day. Proverbs will make you wise. And you ought to read a psalm every day because psalms will make you sweet. Amen? And uh, and I don't know, some of those psalms, David's wishing God would bust the teeth out of some of them. I like those. Amen? And uh, I'm not sure if that's sweet or not, but uh, those imprecatory psalms. Uh, But anyway, uh, we ought to read psalms every day. This thing sounds funny to me. I'm going to switch mics. We're having all kinds of difficulties tonight. Does that one sound a little better? Sounds better up, up here. All right. How about now? Does that sound a little bit better? Not quite so cloudy. Amen. Good. So anyway, I've been reading a lot in the book of Psalms lately, and uh, God has shown me some things here. I like it, and so I'm going to preach the whole, not the whole psalm, probably the first five verses here of Psalm chapter 149. So we'll read the whole chapter And uh, then we'll pray, and we'll just get right into the message tonight. No song. Psalm 149, verse number 1, the Bible says this, Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will, be, or he will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written, This honor have all his saints praise ye the Lord. Let's go ahead and pray. I'm just going to get right into it tonight. Heavenly Father, I do pray that you would help us. God, we need you now as we open the Word of God. I thank you for what you've shown me lately in the Word of God, specifically the book of Psalms. And God, uh, it's a wonderful book, and I thank you for it. I pray that you would help me now to convey the truths that you've given me tonight. I pray that you would inspire us, God, encourage us in this idea of praise. And God, we hear a lot about praise Uh, We sing a lot around here, and uh, God, I think we have an idea of what praise is, but God, as we dig a little deeper into it tonight, I pray that you would help us to see it for what it really is, what you designed it to be, what you want from it and for it, and God, I pray that we would decide to apply it to our lives. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We live in a very negative world. Would you agree with that? I mean, you turn on the news, and it's negative everywhere. I mean, there's wars. There's, uh, as the Bible would say, there's rumors of wars. Uh, Everybody hates everybody in politics. Newscasters don't like each other. Uh, Athletes don't like each other. I mean, it's, it's just bad news, negativity, hatred everywhere we go. You go to work, and nobody likes the boss, right? The boss doesn't like the employees. Nobody gets paid enough. Uh, I mean, it's just down, 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 negative, negative, negative everywhere we go. How many of you agree you don't get paid enough? Amen? Sure. Negative. You're all not right with God tonight. I'm just kidding. Some of you probably don't get paid enough. Um, I was in a McDonald's in New Jersey the other day, and uh, I noticed, of course, they haven't done it here yet, but I know out west they've upped the minimum wage to $15 an hour for all those folks at McDonald's. And, uh, you know, they thought that was great until they've been replaced by kiosks. Now you walk into a McDonald's over there in New Jersey and uh, you go to a kiosk and you push little buttons and screens and order your food and then it shows up on the counter a few minutes later. You don't even have to talk to anybody. So now instead of making $15 an hour, uh, they make it nothing because they lost their job to a machine. And so anyway, negativity, that's all I'm saying. We live in a negative world. And if we're not careful as Christians, we understand that we ought to be the happiest people around. Really, we ought to be. I mean, we're saved by the grace of God. 
Uh, we've got a home in heaven one day. God's given us multiplied blessings daily. He loaded us with benefits, the Bible says. God's been good to us, and we ought to be the happiest people around. But even as Christians living in a very negative world, sometimes that rubs off on us. That negativity, it can, it can bring us down. It can, it can discourage us. It can depress us. Even if we're trying actively to not be a part of it, I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to be negative. You get around a bunch of people that are negative, and, man, it just it, it, it closes in on your spirit. It depresses you. It discourages you. What is a Christian to do? It can rob us, the negativity, it can rob us of joy and peace. It can rob us of our positive spirit. And if it gets all of those things, it even robs us of our praise. Our praise. I'm going to preach tonight on this thought, praising keeps us positive. Praising keeps us positive. Now, obviously, God wants us to praise Him and to worship Him. We can find it all through the Psalms. Christians ought to be praising But in a negative world, it's vital because that praise is what helps me stay on top side. It helps me stay above all of the negativity. You see, we have to choose to actively praise. Well, what are we praising? What is there to praise about? Well, there's nothing in the world to praise. Uh, I mean, the world's going to hell. There's disease. There's, There's war. There's all kinds of problems going on in the world. So what are we supposed to praise? We're supposed to praise the Lord. But sometimes we lose sight of God and we get our sight on everything that's going on around us and we stop praising and that negativity just overtakes us. And so I want to help us with that tonight out of this psalm. Now, uh, in the last five psalms, the last five chapters, rather, of the book of Psalms, every chapter starts with the the same first word, praise. Chapter 146, 147, 148, 149, and 150 all start with the same word, praise. Praise. In fact, the word praise in these five chapters is used 40 times. That doesn't count the word praises. A few times it says sing the praises. All right, that's just the word praise 40 times. I told the girls tonight on Soul Winning, uh, Teen Soul Winning, the word praise is only in the Bible 216 times. And 40 of them, that's almost 20%, are in the last five chapters of Psalms. That blew my mind or was pretty impressive to me. The Bible talks a lot about psalms. Now, quickly flip back to Psalm 146. Let's look at something. Psalm chapter 146, David says in verse 1, Praise you, the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. It's personal. It's private. Verse number 2, While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. So David in Psalm 146, it's a personal decision. He's saying, I'm going to praise. And then he goes on in chapter 146 to speak about some of the things to praise God for. Uh, Verse number 5, happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help. We can praise God because he helps us, uh, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever. God changes not. God gave us the truth of the word of God one time, and he's never had to edit the Bible. The Jehovah's Witness changed their Bible every time they get a new uh, president of the Jehovah's Witness organization. Uh, Mormons change their Bible from time to time. Uh, All of these other religions, they change their Bible. They change their mantra, their doctrine occasionally. That book hasn't changed since God wrote it thousands of years ago because it's truth. God doesn't need to change it. He doesn't need to fix anything. That's a reason that we can praise God. And so the rest of Psalm 146, David is talking about, he's listing things to praise God for. And in chapter 147, he just keeps going with that list. Verse number one, praise you the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God. It is pleasant and praise is comely. And here he goes, the Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. Aren't you glad he gathers together the outcasts? Because we're outcasts. We are Gentile dogs. And God said, I'll take them. I want them. I choose you. We're the outcasts, and God has accepted us. He's gathered us. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Did you catch that? All of the stars. And you can't see the stars in Philly like you can when you get out in the country. 
But you get out from underneath the city lights and you look up and you start looking at the stars. And all we can see is just a little part of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And who knows how many thousands of galaxies are out there. And the Bible just said right there that all of those individual stars, God has named them. That's pretty incredible. In the book of Matthew, he talks about knowing the numbering the hairs on your head. How many of you ever tried to count how many hairs you got? Some of you, that'd be easier than others. I'm not naming any names. So he goes on in chapter 147 to just describe the goodness of God, the, the, the immensity of God, and why we should praise God. Then we get to chapter 148, and really he says all of God's creation. Look at 148. Praise you the Lord. Praise you the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Then look at this, verse number 2. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise ye him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. And he goes on down through it. Look at verse number 10. Beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all people. He's just basically saying all of God's creation ought to be praising the Lord. Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, hey, if you don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. Humans are the only part of God's creation that can choose to not be what God created him to be those trees out there they don't get to decide to one day wake up and be a, a dog they don't get to decide one day i want to be a planet they're trees and they are exactly they are fulfilling exactly what god created them to fulfill they're playing their role but humans we're created with that free will the choice, the ability to choose to worship and praise God, the ability to choose to be what God's created us, or the ability to say, no, I don't want to go God's direction. And so we're the only ones that in many cases don't praise Him like we should. But in chapter 148, he says all basically all of God's creation. And then in chapter 149, he gets to the congregation. The congregation, verse number 1, praise you the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. We're going to come back to 149, so I won't spend a lot of time right there. But he's talking about praising God corporately. Chapter 146, David said, it's I. I will sing praise privately. But then in chapter 149, he's saying, hey, we need to be praising God. 148, everything, all of God's creation ought to be praised. Even the lost people ought to be praising God. They ought to be thanking God. They ought to be looking to God and saying, thank God that God's given us what He's given us. But even if they don't understand it, we get to 149, God's people ought to be praising God instead of getting caught up in the complaining and the negativity that goes on around us so many times. And then in chapter 150, he really just sums it all up in the last verse. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord Praise ye the Lord. And so those last five chapters of Psalms deal with this idea of praise. Now you can go back and read it later, all of these things that we ought to be praising God for. That's not what I'm going to preach about tonight. We'll end with one thing on what to praise God for. But really I want to focus tonight on this idea of just simply praising. Praising. We think we praise and I say we, I think I, you know, we come to church and we have the song service and that is praise and that is worship and we're singing songs to God. But are we actively participating in praising God? Because the praising helps me stay positive in this negative world that I live in. And so we're going to focus on that one thought tonight about are we really praising. Let's go to verse number 1, and we're just going to break this psalm down, the first four or five verses, and we'll go quickly. But I want to break it down. I want you to see praise in a new light. I saw it in a new way. I've been in church my whole life and thought, well, you know, we praise God when we get to church. But I wonder how many of us have ever praised God privately, like David said, at home. I mean, sometimes we come in here and God shows up here and, man, we start to cry and we start to shout and people will wait, raise their hands and, and some people will stand up and raise both hands. Some people come to the altar. But do we ever have that kind of praise at home? Because that's not just supposed to be at church. It's not just a come to church three times a week and if we praise here, we're okay. All through, 40 times in the last five chapters, David's telling us, hey, praise God. 
praise God. And we can find it all through the Bible that we ought to be praising and worshiping. So let's break this down. Verse number 1, chapter 149. I'm going to define a lot of these words. If you're taking notes, I hope you can keep up. If not, you can see my notes afterwards. Uh, But verse number 1, praise ye the Lord. What does the word praise mean? The, the, the Hebrew word for praise is, uh, I mean, if you remember this, uh, when Brother Woodcock preached it a year or so ago, halal. It's where we get our word what? Hallelujah. He preached that Sunday school lesson, or it was that Sunday morning, he preached on halal el. Praise and el is God. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's where we get our word hallelujah from. And so that's, that's the word that praise is. Here's what it means. To be clear. To shine. To make a show, it means to boast or to rave or to celebrate. Now, think about your praise. Think about praise. We think about it when we come to church, and there are times when we're making it clear. We're making it known. We're making it a show. Uh, not, not a show for mankind, okay? And that's not what we're saying here. But we are, we are making it clear. We are praising God. And we don't care what people think. We don't care what the world thinks. We don't care what others think. Man, we sit on the front row. You sit in the pew back there and somebody starts singing or somebody starts preaching. You think, man, that, this is good. Amen. Hallelujah. You're making it clear that you agree that you like what God's doing in your spirit at that moment. But do we ever do that any other place? but sitting in the church house. Psalm 117 says we ought to be praising the Lord so that the world can see us. Listen, praise is a very powerful witnessing tool. You know why so many of the lost world, they don't want our God? Because we don't praise Him out there. We might come in here and praise Him, but really your praise doesn't do me any good. And my praise doesn't do you any good. It may help somebody else to praise a little bit, so it might do a little bit of good. But praise is first and foremost to worship God, and then it's to draw a lost world to, hey, why are they worshiping him so much? Why are they praising him so much? Hey, we live in a terrible world. We just got done saying that. We live in a negative world, and the world sees us. We go out to work every day, and, man, we got a smile on our face. And Man, it's good to be alive. How are you doing today? Man, I am great. I'm blessed by the best. I'm better than I deserve. God is wonderful to me. God's done tremendous things for me. And, man, they're negative, and they're looking at you going, how is that even possible? How can you say God's good? Life's terrible. No, no, life's not terrible. Circumstances might not look that good, but God is good. God is wonderful. God is great. God is worthy to be praised. And man, when I start to praise out there, it draws them in. But if I let their negativity draw me in and I become just like them, I'm just a terrible witness. Me. And so praise, it means to be clear. To be clear. To shine. When you turn on a light, you want it to shine, don't you? Right? You, want, you go into a dark room, a dark closet, uh, you go down your basement, you want a light to shine. And you don't want some dim little uh, battery-operated light that the batteries are about dead. Amen? You want a bright light. That's what our praise is. It ought to shine brightly. Do we privately do those things? Now, I understand this chapter is talking to corporate or to a gathering of people, but do we even do this privately? What about here at church when we're trying to? to praise the Lord collectively? Do you engage in that? Or do you just sit and watch as others praise? Hey, we're all part of the church. We're all supposed to be praising. We're all supposed to be worshiping. We're not supposed to hide it. We're not supposed to keep it subdued because that's just not my personality. Listen, uh, there's nothing in this chapter that talks about praising God if that's your personality. You're just supposed to praise God. Now, you may be the quiet type, but you can still praise. You may be the loud type. You may be the preacher uh, who likes to stand up and shout sometimes and wave his hands. You say, well, I can't do that. That would be embarrassing. Why would that be embarrassing? Because we're too worried about what other people think instead of what God thinks. And that's I'm talking to me. There have been times when I've sat in a service and, and wanted to stand up. And wanted to stand up and wave my hands, and I, and I began to look around and think, well, no, I'm, that's just not my personality. And I let 
what other people might think squelch my praise. You know what that does? That quenches the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I'm not, listen, we're not charismatic. We're not saying everybody in here ought to get up the next service and start running laps around the auditorium. Okay? But if God tells you to run a lap, we're going to talk about this in a minute. Praise is more than just lips. We'll talk about hands. What we'll Anyway, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Praising. Praising. So he says, praise ye the Lord. Then number two, he says this, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing. How many of you know what the word sing means? I'm going to educate you. Sing means to sing. See, you learned something new tonight, didn't you? It literally means to sing. It means to ma- not talk. I'm talking right now. This is talking. Might be considered yelling in some circles. This isn't yelling. This is yelling. But whatever you think, this is not singing, is it? I'm not singing you a message tonight. I'm preaching to you a message. But right there it says to sing. Now this is again talking. He, we'll get to the end of the verse. And he says, in the congregation of the saints. We are the saints. We are the congregation of the saints. And so David, God, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling David to write this, or whoever wrote this song, tell them to sing. Now don't raise your hands. But how many of us, I won't even look. I'll just turn my back so I don't. How many of us have ever come to church and sat in the song service and never sang? It says it right there. Sing. 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 Listen, when you don't sing, you're missing an opportunity to praise the God of heaven. Praise ye the Lord. Say, well, I don't sing good. It's not in there. In fact, in another psalm, it says, make a joyful noise. Some of you, that may be all you can make is noise. But do it anyway, because it's in the book. And listen, God says, sing to me. Sing. We all like to sing in the car. We all like to sing. Pastor talks about singing in the shower. I mean, we've all got those places we get out and mow in the yard. If anybody has a yard in the city, uh, you get get that that lawnmower going, making all that noise, and what do you do? You start singing, some of you. Hey, why don't we come in here and sing? We'll sing in other places. We'll sing when we're alone. We'll sing in the car. Uh, we'll sing at the house, and then we come into the house of God, and we don't want to sing. Man, get a hymn book out, open the hymn book up, and sing. That's what God wants from you. That's not what we want from you. That's not what the preacher wants from you. That's what God wants. He says, sing unto the Lord a new song. The idea behind sing there is a strolling minstrel. If you think decades, centuries, millennia ago, uh, when there were kings and, and knights and all of that stuff, they had these minstrels that would come in and they would say that was their job. They would come in and sing for the king. Think about David and King Saul. When Saul had that evil spirit from the Lord, what did they do? They found David who could play the harp, and he came in. He was a minstrel. David obviously was a singer. Most of these psalms that he wrote, the book of Psalms is a song book. And so David would sing, uh, and so he would make music. That was his job. Strolling means to travel around. Minstrel means to make music. And so the idea behind the word sing is to roam around, stroll around, continually singing now let's take this outside the walls of the church do we have a song out there david says often he's put a new song in my heart when we get saved god puts a song in our heart listen we ought to be singing go to the grocery store and sing victory in jesus go to the grocery store and sing praise him praise him jesus our blessed redeemer sing i dare you i dare me i dare all of us hey sing Sing. This is just as much as me. That, the first time I heard preachers preacher singing Victory in Jesus in a grocery store, I was embarrassed. And I wasn't even with him. I was like four aisles away and heard him. Hey, I'm just saying. But he's not ashamed. Why should, I, why, why should we be ashamed of our God? Do we really love him like we come in here and tell each other we love him, but we're afraid to go out there and tell them that we love him? That's what this is saying. Sing. Sing. Then he says, sing a new song. 
Listen, there's something wrong with a Christian who won't sing. Just absolutely right. There's something wrong with a Christian who finds it hard to sing, who won't sing. Because God's put a new song in our heart. It's inside us. Then he says, number three, a new song. Sing a new song unto the Lord. Now, this isn't necessarily talking about a brand new song or a a, a new musical piece. But here's what the idea is. It means fresh. Fresh. It's talking about singing praises. Look at it. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. So when we're singing, what are we singing? We're singing the praises of God. Well, how often is God good to you? All the time. So our songs of praise ought to be fresh. We might sing, I love the Lord. He heard my cry. He lifted me way up high. But it should never, ever get to be, I love the Lord. He heard my cry. He lifted me way up high. That's not fresh. You know what's happened to that song? You know, there's nothing happened to the song. The song is still right. The song is still true. The problem is with the singer. Because we have ceased to get fresh bread from God. We've ceased to have that, 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 t- that close relationship with God where His mercies, the Bible says His mercies are new every day. We ought to have a new testimony. We ought to have a new song, a fresh song. Even if it's the same old amazing grace that we've sung for the last 200 years, it ought to do something in our spirit. It ought to do something in our heart instead of just coming here and amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You are a wretch! And thank God you're saved. And it is amazing grace. But I get caught up in it. Come in here. I I know a lot of these songs. I could sing them without even looking at them. And without even thinking about them. And the truth is, a lot of times we do that. That's not praise. That's not a new song. That's not a fresh song. That's just ritualism traditionalism that's going through the motions are you going through the motions tonight hey i'm saying praise will make you positive praise will keep you positive in this negative world so he says sing a new song not a new not necessarily new music although i'm not against that but new praise because god's relationship with me and god's blessings for me are fresh every single day how many of you like leftovers How many of you don't like leftovers? I'll eat them. Right? I'll eat leftovers. But I'm not a huge fan of leftovers. You know why? Because I'm fat. I meant to say I'm a foodie. Who's laughing? Did you just say I was fat, Carlos? (laughs) Don't point. (laughs) I'm a foodie. And so, man, anytime it's time to eat, I want to try something new. I want to try something good. And I really don't like leftovers when it was like, eh, that was okay. And usually that's where there's leftovers. It's the meal that was like, that's all right. No, I don't want seconds. So then you have to have it for lunch tomorrow because it's a sin to throw food away, apparently. Right? We can't let it go to waste. So then I got to eat it for lunch. And I'm like, oh, God help me. I think I'm going to, I'm fasting today. But then it's there the next day. Like, fine, let me eat this so we can get some good food, right? Hey, God never gives me leftovers. That silly illustration, I almost lost my train of thought. God doesn't give me leftovers. God's blessings to me every day are fresh, are new. His mercies are new. Man, when you, when you think about it, when you open up that Bible, you start reading, and you've got, a, you've got a mind for God. You're concentrating. You're focused. You've prayed, said, God, speak to me. You open that up, and God shows you something. It's pretty good. It's good. And if you've never experienced that, then you ought to read your Bible. You ought to get a hold of the Lord. I'm simply saying, he says, sing a new song, a fresh song. His mercies are new every day. His answers to prayer are new every day. His grace is new every day. God's a wonderful God. Amen. And he wasn't just wonderful 10 years ago. I'm all for telling testimonies of what God did in the past. But have you got anything fresh? Listen, if you're, still, if you're still telling the same testimony that you told 10 years ago and you got nothing new, something wrong with your Christianity. 
Because God's been a lot better to you in the last 10 years than what you obviously have realized. And I'm not, I don't know that anybody's in here is doing that. But if you're constantly living on those old answers to prayer, where's the new ones? Where's the fresh ones? Man, you need to freshen up your walk with God. You need to freshen up your relationship with God. That was a wonderful testimony that Kesley had a year or so ago when Brother Charlie gave her that, uh, took that $1,000 or whatever it was off her school bill. But don't live on that one. Well, you get a fresh answer to prayer. You get a new need. You get a new storm. You get a new answer from God. You get a new partnership with God. Uh, we heard Brother Randy Dignan preaching at camp. He said, get a partnership with your Bible. When was the last time you got something out of your Bible? Not at church. You and God sitting at home reading your Bible, and God showed up and gave you something. If it's been a while, you need to get a partnership with that book. Not just to crack it open and read the three chapters a day so we can mark it off on that chart. You need to get a partnership with that thing because God, God wants to talk to you. He wants to speak to you. Sing a new song. Then number four, let me hurry. Number four, still in verse number one, sing a new song and his praise in the congregation of his saints. While praise should be a big part of our private lives, it is specifically said here that it is in the congregation of the saints. The word congregation means assembly. You know what that word is? In the New Testament, the word is ecclesia, a called out assembly. You know what that is? The church. We are a congregation. We're an assembly of the saints. And listen, God says, right here in the book of Psalms, He says, we ought to be singing and praising in the congregation. If you're not going to sing and praise God here, you're never going to do it at home. I mean, church services are designed to help you praise God. That's why we sing first. We come in here, man, we've all got baggage from the world. The world's kicked us around and, and made fun of us, and we've got problems, and life has built up on us through the week, and we come in here, and he started preaching a word right off the bat. None of us would get anything. And so we start singing. You know why we sing first? We're trying to get our minds off of this and get our minds on him. So the church service is designed to help us praise God. And if we come in here and never open a songbook and we stand there or sit there like a bump on a log and we don't sing and we, we cross our arms with the whole, you know, bless me if you can, whatever kind of attitude. And I'm not saying anybody's got that, but, uh, you know, we, we have that bit that, that comes in sometimes. If you don't do it here, you're never going to do it at home. David said, I made a choice in Psalm 146. I will sing. Whether private, that was a private decision, but I guarantee you by the time Psalm 149 rolls around, he's saying to the church, hey, we're going to do this and I'm going to do it. I already made a choice. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to worship God. I'm not coming into a church service anymore where I'm not going to sing. I'm going to sing. I'm going to praise. I'm going to worship. I'm going to be a part of this. Open your hymn book. Sing aloud. Smile. Amen? Smile. J.D., better smile or I'm going to throw the song book at you. Okay, thanks. Praise, man. Pray. We come in here sometimes, and I, listen, I do understand. You come, especially on a Thursday night. We come in here and, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all day Thursday, the world, we've been having to deal with the negativity of the world. It's hard sometimes to come in and put a smile on your face. But if you'll make a choice to praise God, Right out of the gate, soon as we start the service, soon as we start singing, I promise you before the song service is over, you'll feel it in your spirit. You'll feel different, but it starts with a decision. Everybody else can't praise for you. You have to praise. So he says it's in the congregation of the saints. Let's go on. Uh, the next one, I think it's number five. Verse number two, let Israel rejoice in him that made him. You know what the word rejoice means? It means to brighten up to cheer up, and to be glad. Brighten up. How many of you have ever said to somebody, hey, cheer up, brighten up, be glad, anything like that. Hey, smile a little bit. Smile a little bit. Hey, smile a little bit, youth choir. You guys can't see it. Sometimes I'm sitting here, I got my back to you, and I'm, I, got my, I get my fingers up here. I'm pushing the corners of my mouth. I'm like, smile. So I look at some of them straight in the face for 10 or 15 seconds, and they're hardcore. I'm singing, I'm like, and they just stone cold. Look me right in the eyeballs. I love the Lord. He heard my cry. He lifted me away. Like, you ain't going to make me smile. 
I'm not looking at anybody over here. Okay, maybe a couple of them. I'm just saying, hey, smile. You, it, we all know, right, it takes less muscles to smile than it does to frown. Everybody know I love you? Amen. Smile. Thanks, Andrew. Andrew's got a good smile. Let's move on. Rejoice. Brighten up. I mean, think about it. Why should we cheer up? Well, who are we singing to? Who are we singing about? Listen, these songs in this songbook, we're not singing about us. We're not singing. Why should we cheer up? Why should we cheer up? Uh, Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior. Know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin. He's the only one that can do that. That's a reason to cheer up. And the fact that he would cleanse you from every sin is a blessing. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. No one ever cared for me out like Jesus. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus. You know, one of the... This is just free. I keep, I'm going to walk over here because I keep walking to the left side. Help Brother Hayward out, give that camera some action on the other side. You ought to find, you go to a thrift store, find you an old hymn book and buy it. And read it with your devotions. It'll do wonders for your spirit. Don't sing. Read it. Ephesians 5 verse 19 says, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and there's a there's a time and a place to sing in your devotions. I sing sometimes, but sometimes I get the hymn book out and I just read. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus, since I found in Him a friend so strong and true. I would tell you how He changed my life completely. How many of you had your life changed? He did something that no other friend could do. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me, and he led me in the way I ought to go. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. Assurance of what? That I belong to him. I am his and he is mine. He supplieth all my need every day. He comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love. But I'll never know just why he came to save me till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. We don't sing it like that. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus. Since I found in him a friend so strong and true, I wonder what is for lunch this afternoon and what I'm going to do the rest of the week. No one ever cared for me like the eagles. See, if we sang what was in our minds, there'd be no praise going on sometimes. Stop and read some of those. It'll bless your heart. It'll help you get in that attitude of praise. Rejoice. Cheer up. What have we got to rejoice about? How about God? Then look at verse number 2 again. Let us rejoice in Him that made Him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their King. You know what the word joyful means? I couldn't believe it. Literally, the word joyful means to spin around in emotion. This is not my personality. <laughs> Guys, if you ever do that, we're going to think bad things about you. But how many of you have ever seen girls do that? Girls get excited about stuff. I've seen guys do it. That's literally what that means, the word joyful. Be joyful. Let the children of the king be joyful. Why should we be joyful? How about just I'm the child of the king? My father is rich in houses and lands. He holds the wealth of the world in his hands. 
I'm a child of the king. A child of the king. <laughs> When's the last time you ever spun around? You say, oh, that, that means that we ought to just do that maybe mentally. Or me-. That's not what that says. That's not figurative speech. The word joyful means literally spin around. Now, if you all start spinning around Sunday, the preacher's going to fire me. So I'm just saying, don't everybody go crazy, charismatic. But if God tells you to spin around, maybe you ought to spin around a little bit. Maybe you ought to get a little bit happy and raise your hand a little bit. We'll, We'll get into that. Be joyful. Be glad. I guarantee you... Here. Let me get, let me, I'll say that in a minute. Next, look at verse number three. Verse number three. Let them praise his name in the, what's the word? Oh my goodness, we're not allowed to dance. It's wicked, it's ungodly. You're right. But that's not what that's talking about. David danced before the Lord. The Bible talks about lifting holy hands. Now listen, don't misunderstand we're not, this is not at all talking about sensual, worldly, ungodly movement of your body. That's why we're very careful about the music we sing and play here. We're not looking to make anybody wiggle around ungodly like. Think more along the lines of if any of the Philadelphia teams ever won their championship, what would you do? Some of you might faint, yeah. Brother Hayward, if the Eagles win the Super Bowl this year, are you going to dance? Absolutely. It's not going to be ungodly. I guarantee you he'll probably be going, yeah, running up and down the aisles, running around the house, waving his hands. There'll be some dancing going on, but it's not nasty, sinful dancing. Think along those lines. Now, again, I'm not saying we ought to stand up in here and go nutso in church. But that's exactly what that's talking about. Praising God. It's okay to raise your hand every now and then. It's okay to, like the preacher, let out a holy shout. You see, we've gotten too, we've gotten too uh, rigid in our praise and worship in our churches. We're afraid. Man, I grew up in a church where it was, it was weird if somebody said amen louder than amen. I mean, if it was any louder than that, people, half the auditorium went. Who are they? Why don't we have a security team? Get that charismatic fool out of here. When I was a kid, there was a guy that would sit in the balcony of our church. So when my dad was in Bible college. He would sit in the balcony of our church, and he, w- he would wind up like an airplane engine. When he would say amen. You, you could hear it. It took forever because he'd wind up and wind down. I mean, and it would start, the preacher would say something and you'd hear him. Mm-hmm. We sat in the third row. He's in the balcony in a church about the size of solid rock. And you could hear. Mm-hmm. Not exaggerating. Mm-hmm. Amen. That's exactly how he did it. Wound all the way back down. I mean, we all forgot what he was amening by the time he finished. Now, we're not looking for you to grab the attention from the service because your praise and worship goes schizophrenic. But it might be okay every now and then. If God gets all over you and says, you know what, why don't you stand up and wave your hands a little bit? Why don't you stand up and clap a little bit and just worship me and praise God? I've been in services where people stood up in the front row and turned around and just started praising God. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been real good. I mean, stuff going on at the pulpit. And he's, he's preaching away at the crowd. I love the Lord. He just get involved in praise and worship. It doesn't have to just be... You know what a lot of independent fundamental Baptist praise and worship is? One more and I'm through. Amen. 
That's the most praise and worship you'll get out of some of those folks. See, the preacher closed his Bible, and they're like, thank God the roast ain't going to burn. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. We're almost done. Timbrel and harp. You know what he's saying there? Use instruments. Literally, use instruments. This I thought was interesting. You know what the word harp means? We know what a harp is, but you know what the word harp there in that verse means? God's a southerner. Because the word harp there means to twang. Literally, in the Hebrew, it means to twang. Guitars, banjos, fiddles, not violins, fiddles. Amen. <laughs> I don't know if that's literally. That is what the word means, but anyhow. Uh, Listen, if you can use an instrument and you're not, shame on you. God gave you an ability. God gave you a talent. If you can play the viola and you don't, shame on you. Sorry, Kesley. <laughs> viola, yeah, it's just a big fiddle. If you can't use an instrument, why don't you learn to play something? You know what? In Ephesians 5, verse number 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Then it says singing and making melody. You know what the phrase making melody there means? To play an instrument. To play an instrument. Listen, God likes music. God created Lucifer, who was the music of heaven before he fell. God inhabits the praise and the worship of his people, the Bible says. And so we ought to be praising. If you can play an instrument, play it for the Lord. Get your guitar out. Get your viola out. Get your spoons out. Whatever you can play. If all you can play is the radio, turn it on real low so you can praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But play something. Sing to the Lord. Worship the Lord with music. Look at verse number 5. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Verse number 6, let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Listen, I'm just saying tonight we ought to be praising. If you're discouraged tonight, I guarantee you if you'll spend some time praising God, you won't leave here as discouraged. Your problem might still be there, but you won't be as depressed about it. You won't be as negative about it. You won't be as discouraged and down about it. Why? Because God can handle whatever it is you're depressed about. God can handle whatever whatever it is you're discouraged about. And just because the situations in the world and the situations in your life look bleak, God is not bleak. God is in control. God is not caught off guard by your problems. God is not taken by surprise by your problems. God knows exactly what's going on in your life. And He's still good. And He's still God. And He will be tomorrow. And when you're dead and gone, He'll still be God. And He'll still be good to everybody that's left here behind us going through storms in their life. God doesn't change. The circumstances of this life don't change God. He's good. And if I'll spend some time with my eyes on Him, praising Him for how good He is, the fact that He created those stars, and the stars also. Who was it recently that came through here and preached and said that that was one of their favorite passages in the Bible? They go all through Genesis, the first couple of chapters on creation. And God did this, and God did that, and God made the beasts of the field, and God made the sun, and God made the stars, and uh, the, the moon. And by the way, he, he made the stars also. You, you ever study stars? That's not just a, uh, let, me throw a let me throw something out there. That'd be like me going home and saying, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to make a car. No big deal. I got no parts. I got no know-how, but I'm just going to build a Corvette, have it done before the morning. All of you would look at me and go, you're an idiot. God says, oh, yeah, I just, I just made the stars, too. No big deal. There they are. Listen, why don't we praise God a little bit? Stop looking around you. Stop looking at what others have and you don't have and stop looking at, at, at why the situation of your life might be so discouraging or why you're going through this trial and other people aren't going through this trial. And, and whatever it might be, then stop looking here and start looking here. 
Look at verse number four and we're done. I told you I'd give you one reason to praise God tonight. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. Think about that. The Lord taketh pleasure in his people. Taketh pleasure means two things. It means to be pleased with. Revelation chapter 4 verse number 11 says we're created for his pleasure. But you know what else to be pleased with means? Or the Lord taketh pleasure? It means to satisfy a debt. To satisfy a debt. You see, when Jesus Christ died for me, I incurred a debt to him that I could never repay. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I've given God my life. Hopefully, you've given God your life. But the giving of God, or the giving of our lives to God, we'll never be able to repay that debt. But when I praise God, he says I take pleasure in that. And that means it satisfies the debt. That doesn't mean you ought to serve. That doesn't mean you you shouldn't serve God with your life. Everybody in here ought to give God their entire life. God, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. Uh, Whatever it is. But you know what that means? God is pleased and satisfied when I praise. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in doing good works and we get negative about those good works. I've got to run a bus route again today. Man, it's so stinking hot out. We've got to go soul one and it's 85 degrees out. I'm, I'm sweating. It's hot. I've got to teach a Sunday school class to a bunch of kids that they don't care. I got to come, Miss Linda. Nobody, I don't know if anybody knows this. Miss Linda comes every Thursday and cleans these bathrooms, and she always has a sweet spirit about it. But I don't know if she's not in one of those bathrooms one day, going, "Why didn't anybody else ever come in here and clean a bathroom? Why is it only me that comes cleans a bathroom?" And and I don't think she does. I'm, but I'm saying, I've had thoughts like that. Why did anybody else have to do this? Why? 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 Was, You know, why don't I just praise God because I get to do anything for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the God of heaven, the creator of the universe that reached, I'm an outcast, and he gathered me in. And not only did he gather me in, but he gave me something that I can do for him. I can tell other people about him. He gave me a voice that I can sing and that I can speak, and he gave me some ability that I can serve God with, and he gave me a job so I can give some tithe in the offering plate. And instead of complaining about it and getting negative about the Christian life, why don't I go, I can't believe God would let me do something for him. This is unbelievable. If the Philadelphia Eagles called Hayward tomorrow, said, we want you to come play center, I guarantee you he'd quit his job. Well, I'd forget it, right? You'd be there. If we would do something, if we'd do something like that for the Eagles or whatever it is that you would quit your job for, why can't we be like that for God who gave us everything? I am what I am today because of him. I have what I have today because of him. Praise will keep you positive. God is satisfied and he's pleased when we praise him. By the way, when I'm praising, I don't have time to be negative. When I'm actively praising, I don't have time to be negative. So let me ask you tonight, how's your praise? And I don't just mean sitting in church. How's that going? But your life in general, are you praising God? There's There's plenty to praise Him for. We've got a whole book of stuff we can praise God for. I don't need to tell you what to praise Him for. I'm just trying to ask you tonight, are you? Are you? 
Heads bowed, eyes closed.